And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Tone, who died in a burning building and went to the third level of heaven, which we're going to learn about and more. Tone, thank you for joining me and welcome. Hello, Jeff. Thank you for having me. Much love to you and also much love to the people in the comments. On any video, you always go to the comments. So I resonate with the people of the comments. Much love to you and love to them as well. Well, Tone, we all love you and we're happy to have you today. So let's start on the day that you died in that building and go from there. Okay. Now, before we start, Jeff, I would like to say this. I don't really refer to the experience as a near death experience because when you are in the realm of source, I consider that life because that is our home. That is our real estate. So I actually refer to it as a near life experience because in actuality, we are spirit. We have left actuality and descended into biological bodies which is the opposite of spirit, which is physicality. So when we were birthed into physicality, we actually entered a state of death or sleep in a sense. So the physical realm or the human state of being is the separation of spirit. And I refer to source as near life. In actuality, we are spirit. But when we birthed into the physical bodies, we took on physicality, which gave us a brain. And now that brain reciprocates the consciousness of this earthen narrative, which has created a veil between the physical realm and the spiritual realm. This is why people have to be knocked out of their body to experience the spiritual realm, because the body reciprocates the physical consciousness, which keeps you anchored into the physical realm. So I do refer to these experiences as near life. And when you birth into physicality, you're actually in a state of death. Even in the Bible, Jesus said, let the dead bury their dead. I always hear people um, say, death doesn't exist on the other end, but death never meant you cease to exist. One of the definitions of death It just meant the ceasing of your biological functions. So it wasn't that death ever meant that you cease to exist. It just meant meant that the biological physicalities ceased. So there is a death. There's actually two states of death that I could speak on, which is another video. So we do die, but the death of the biological body is not who you are in essence. So of course you go on. Just wanted to throw that in there. Tone, I agree with what you're saying. And I was just talking to a guest yesterday about what the veil is or isn't. And I think what you're saying is the only veil that there is, is just being in a body. Right. Well, it's not necessarily just the body, but the fact that the body has a brain. And if you look at what Earth is, everything that we do is premeditated. Um, I can predict mostly everybody's life. The kids are either going to graduate or they're not. The the, um, cleaners are either going to get the stain out or they aren't. The kids are going to win the soccer game or they aren't. So everything that the brain is reciprocating is automatically a premeditated consciousness. So if we're tending to something premeditated, that means we're pretending. And to pretend means that we have went into a simulated state of being. And so mm-hmm. that's what I mean. It's it's a, a limited narrative, but we are unlimited beings. Most people, most of the humans think that depression is when something happens within the earth and consciousness that they are either upset about or angry about. But depression is the fact that we are unlimited beings that have been depressed into a limited way of thinking. The earth and consciousness does not produce enough radiation to bring the body into a celestial form to travel out of this realm. That's why we are anchored here. All right. Well, let's get back to your story. Okay. And what happened on the day that you were in that burning building? Okay. Is it okay if I provide a bit of context? Sure. Okay. So 
Um, as you can see behind me, there's my fireman jacket. I was a fireman. Um, and I guess I could call it a past life, but the one who died. And um, around that time, I just felt this void, um, such as nothing was fulfilling me because I had been a fireman for four years. And I was like, if I got that job, I'll be fulfilled. If I get this car, I'll be fulfilled. And there was just a void. And so around the time I, I was a fireman, we had a fire at a biodiesel plant. And I'll never forget, they said, if the plant explodes, it's going to wipe out a two block radius. And out of all of the eight fire stations, only three people went in. And so they cleared the block out. I went in, I received an award for the mayor, but for bravery, but in the back of my mind, I didn't feel brave. I knew that it wasn't that I went in because I was brave. I just felt this void in life. I wasn't suicidal or anything, but I just felt like I didn't belong. And so fast forward, um, I moved to a different state. And once I did that, these strange things began to happen. Um, I began to have these dreams. And while I was asleep, I would be dreaming. But when I would wake up, I would still see images of what I was seeing in the dream, if that makes sense. Like if I seen a spider crawling up the wall in the dream, once I opened my eyes, I would still see the spider. It's like the realms were merging in a sense. And so I didn't know what was happening at the time. So I just said I was crazy. I wasn't a spiritual person. I was just a, a person that was a, a fireman and moved just to get a better job and I used to drink and uh, things like that. I wasn't into spirituality at all. So when that started happening, I didn't know what was going on. And so around the time, I could not find a job. And I remember talking to my earth mom, um, my biological mom, and she was saying, just trust God. And I grew up in a Baptist church and I had heard that phrase, my whole life, just trust God and God works in mysterious ways. But at the time I was just fed up with hearing that. I was thinking to myself, if I'm gonna trust God, I need to know where is God when all of these things are happening. Here I am, I was a former fireman and now I can't find a job and I feel worthless. And so at the time, I'll never forget to fast forward um, I remember just being in the house and I was saying a derogatory word. I was like, F God. And I was just screaming this to the top of my lungs. And um, I was just saying to myself, F God, God doesn't exist. And this and that, if God exists, why can't I find a job? And I was living in a one bedroom apartment at the time. It was a very small apartment. And um, I, I just felt like my worth was gone. And so I just was around the house screaming, F God, God doesn't exist. And so I went into the bedroom. It was only two rooms. I went into the bedroom and I put my head down on the bed and I began to just pound on the bed and scream into the bed. And I was crying. Tears was coming out of my eye. And I was like, here I am. I moved up here with this lady and I can't even provide what is going on? I feel worthless. And as I began to scream and just cry into the bed, I, I sat there for like three minutes, Jeff. And as I lifted my head up, something had the back of my head. And um, I said to myself, oh my God, I'm about to die. I didn't say this out loud because I thought maybe someone had snuck into the house and had a gun to my head and was going to rob me. And I was like, well, this is it. I'm about to die. So I was making a plan in my head. And um, I said to myself, I'm going to count to 10 and I'm going to try to just get up real fast and just turn around and grab whoever has my head. So I was lifting my head slightly, just trying to break loose or break free or just feel, get a gauge of the grip that the person had on me. And so I did what I said, I, I counted to 10 and I just abruptly got up. But when I got up, Jeff, I was out of my body. 
my body was there laying on my bed. And um, like I said, I wasn't a, a spiritual person at all. So in my mind, I was thinking I'm dead. And so when I got up out of my body, the realm looked exactly like this, like the furniture, the objects, but it was just a bit hazier. It looked kind of dark, like the hue was different. So I began to just turn around and just walk towards the door. I was in the bedroom, so I walked towards the other room and was walking towards the door and all of a sudden I was outside. And like I said, it's still, everything looked the same, like the parking lot, the street light, all of that. And next thing I know, it started getting darker, darker, darker. And I was in pitch blackness. When I said pitch blackness, I mean, I couldn't see nothing like it was the beginning of a construct in a sense to which everything was taken away and it was a blank canvas. And I was looking around, but it was so dark, I couldn't even tell if I was turning around because, you know, objects put things in perspective like this mic. I can say I'm on the left of this mic or in the front of the computer, but when it's pitch black, there's no perspective. So even though I was turning around, I couldn't tell what I was doing. And I just was there in this pitch blackness. And all of a sudden, I just began to panic and just scream out, help, help, help me. And after about a minute of that, I seen this faint light. And I looked in the distance and I, I just started saying, God, help me. And it's odd that the very person that I was saying, "Elf God, now I'm screaming to God for help. But I said, God, help me. And next thing you know, Jeff, I was back in my body in that same position that I was when I was beating on the bed. And as I said, I'm a person that just drank alcohol or beer or two every now and then. Spirituality was not in my algorithm. So at this time, I'm like, what, what just happened? I'm dead, I'm crazy. And I remember the person that um, coming home and I, tell him, I was telling them what happened. Um, and they were just looking at me because that wasn't in our world, those type of things. And they were just looking at me like, you've lost it. You're crazy. So, around, but they didn't say that, but I could tell they thought that. So around that time, Jeff, I just kept going. I kind of liked it because not having a job, it let me know that there was something more than what I thought it was. And so what I did I said, I have to quit drinking because even though I wasn't drunk, I was saying this must be some residue of alcohol from the, the other days or something like that. So I stopped November 26th, day after Thanksgiving, which is a metaphor I use for cold turkey. I just put it down and just stopped drinking. And so next thing you know, I kept having these dreams and there was something called I call it, um, it's, it's called sleep paralysis. This started happening to me a lot to the point where I would go to sleep. I, would, I wouldn't be able to move. I would see characters or figures at my door, but I didn't know what it was. Um, I only seen a figure one time at my door, though, by the way. The other times it was happening, I would just be like frozen, I wouldn't be able to move. I wouldn't be able to scream. I would just be laying there in bed. And this happened a lot. It happened one particular night to the point where I did not, I was afraid to go back to sleep because I was like, this is gonna keep happening. And so one particular time it would happen and I would freeze when I wake up and I would still see people from what, was going on when I was dreaming, if that makes sense. Like if I was dreaming, I would see somebody, then I would wake up and freeze and I would still see those people, but they were in this reality too. And then that reality would dissolve. So it was like it was merging. And so I didn't know what to make of that. Like I said, I thought it was crazy, but I kind of liked it. It scared me, but I just went with it. 
So from that experience, would you conclude that when you're dreaming, it's just not some imaginary world. You're actually in another reality. Uh, right. When we are dreaming, in some cases, we are in alternate realities. If you look at the body, even the body is a vessel, which means boat. Um, you know, the little nursery rhyme, row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. That is indicative to what is happening now. The body is a vessel or a ship, and it's being rolled down this stream of consciousness. And like I said before, we're calling this stream of consciousness life. But this stream of consciousness is a part of creation. Like, for example, we created money, yet in this stream of consciousness, money makes us who we are. How can money make us who we are when we made it? So the creator has become subject to the creation. And so that's how it is. Um, in actuality, we are creators, but we have left actuality and spin off into an alternate reality and we have become residents of creation so when you dream you are experiencing different different alternate realities which is a spin off of actuality as a creator so you started having these extraordinary experiences especially with sleep paralysis with sleep paralysis at what point did you die in a burning building and this is, and here's what I'm getting to now. I, it's, I have to abbreviate it because so much happened. Um, so around one particular dream I had, I went to sleep and I dreamed that my eyes were burning. And the thing is, I woke up and my eyes were still burning. And so the lady I was with at the time, I woke up out of my sleep and I was like, help, my eyes are burning. I don't know what's happening to me. And so I tried my best to open my eyes. And um, when I tried to open my eyes, they just would burn even harder. And so she got up out of the bed. She helped me um, get dressed and things like that. And as we were getting dressed, she went, splashed water on my face. We didn't know what to do. We're sitting on the couch. She's trying to look into my eyes, but I can't open them. And so we then, after she gets me dressed, we make our way out of the house and she's about to take me to the hospital. And um, around that time, as we're going up the stairs, because we live um, basement level in a one bedroom apartment at the time. And I heard, hear this deep inner voice. And this is exactly how the voice sounds. It says, open your eyes. And I open my eyes and the burning stops. And so she's making her way up the stairs and I'm just sitting there on the steps and she's like, come on. And I'm like, as you can see, my eyes are open and stop. And she's like, what's stopping it? And I like, I don't know. Someone told me to open my eyes, but being that we are in the earth and consciousness and not on the intuitive track, that's not logic to us. So she's like, no, nah, it had to be something in it. And so we go back in there, we're sitting on the couch. And she's just looking in my eyes and she's like, it seems like everything is okay. So she goes to sleep. I can't sleep because I heard her inner voice say, open your eyes. I know it's something happening to me. And I'm not going to lie. I thought I was just going crazy. And so I accepted it. And so um, long story short, she gets up, goes to work. Um, at that time, I couldn't find a job and I'm going through all of this. and. Um, the knob on the stove must have been stripped because I'm cooking either some fries or some chicken and there's some grease on the stove. And um, so I turn the knob on the stove. I cook the, um, I'm cooking the food. I go into the other room. Remind you, it's a simple one bedroom apartment. And so I go into the other room to use the bathroom. I'm in there for quite a while, but when I come out, when I open the door to the kitchen or the other room, this thick black smoke just rushed me and it filled my lungs. And as an ex-fireman, I know that the smoke usually will kill you before you get burned because you can't breathe it in. So when the smoke rushed me, Jeff, I'm just holding my eyes and my eyes are burning like crazy. And I'm holding my breath at the time and I'm panicking and I'm like, oh my God, I'm about to die. I'm about to die. And, um, 
I didn't know what to do. So my life didn't, I started thinking about my life. And when I say that it was no flashing, wasn't nothing like that. My life flashed before me. I just started thinking about when I put out that fire in a biodiesel plant and how I felt the void and how nothing here fulfilled me. And I just began to surrender. And I had already was doing that up until this point. And so I'm sitting there holding my breath with my physical hands. And I have my hands over my eyes, but my eyes are shut. And I finally began to um, just give up. But I'm feeling for the wall. Because if you know anything about fires, like it's zero visibility when the smoke is in the room. You can't see anything. The only thing you can see is the fire or the, the blaze from the fire. As firemen, we had to follow the hose out of the building. That's how we got out. But at this point, I'm trying to feel for the wall, but I can't. And I won't lie to you. I felt that void, so I just started to give up. But I was still holding my breath and had my eyes closed. So as I, as I kneeled to the floor, I just said to myself, it is what it is. I don't feel like I belong here anyway. And so I began to just uncover my mouth, but I'm still holding my breath. And I put my hands flat out as if I accept this. And then I just fall to my face, but I'm still holding my breath. And I began to just let my breath go. And I hear this deep audible voice say, open your eyes. That's the part that it always gets me. I can't get past that part, telling that part. And you don't have to cut this out. Let me ask you this. Who do you think the voice was that was telling you, open your eyes? Um, the voice was God. I found that out later. At the time, I did not know. Um, but the voice that was telling me to open my eyes, it was God. And um, I opened my eyes. And um, as I was laying on the floor, my body was invisible. I was not out of my body this time. It was invisible. And I could see the smoke going through my body. And at this point, I'm like, I'm crazy. I accept this. I'm crazy. I don't know what I am. I'm an alien is what I used to call myself because growing up in the Baptist church, this was not told to me. And so I just said, I'm an alien. And um, as I walked toward the fire, my body became solid enough to grab the pot and put the fire out, yet it was still translucent. I walked out of the building and I looked at myself when I got outside and my body was solid again. And at that point, I said to myself, I don't know who you are. I've already read the God of the Bible, even though I had never read the Bible. But whoever you are, I love you. And um, you can have my life. And, and that's what I said to the voice. And um, to, to make a long story short, because it's so much that happened, I began to have more of those experiences like um, sleep paralysis. And I went through this period, which some people refer to as the dark night of the soul. And what it feels like is these voices telling you that you're worthless. You're this, you'll never be anything. And that, that happened for three days to the point where I, it was physical voices. It was literally like demons, like God won't save you in my head. And I remember um, this happened when I was 33, by the way, I'm 43 now. And um, I remember hearing the voices and I started talking back to them like, you're nothing. I'm, you can't say I'm not worth anything. You're not. And I remember saying to myself, I am not telling a soul about these voices in my head. The first thing they're going to do is admit me. 
And I said, I know I'm not crazy because if I can distinguish and talk back to the voices, it must not be me. And so what ended up happening, I would like to explain what was going on, if you don't mind. Sure. What was happening at the time with these voices, as I said earlier, our body is a vessel in a sense, or a ship. And so if you are familiar with the Bible stories, there's a guy named Jonah in the Bible that's thrown overboard and he's thrown into the belly of a whale. And in the Bible, that's actually indicative to the dark night of the soul. See, we are ships and I was thrown overboard. And what that means is take a celebrity, for example, we celebrate celebrities and a little girl says, I want to be like my favorite singer when we grow up. And the physical consciousness says that's a good thing. But the physical consciousness is in contrast to the spirit realm, because even though the little girl views that as a good thing in the physical, in the spirit, this little girl is so in fear of who she is and what she has to bring to the world that she forfeits that just to mimic something that's already accepted. So the things that we do in the physical consciousness is kind of like a disguise to cover up the lower vibration that we're really calibrated to in spirit. So when I was thrown overboard or out of the vessel, I was thrown into the belly of the beast, which is indicative to the lower chakra to face what is really there in contrast to the physical consciousness. And so what I did, I had to take back what is referred to, the, to as the keys of life and know who I am aside from what society says, aside from what people celebrate in the physical consciousness to regain my life and spirit. So as I went through this process, it happened for like three days. And I'll never forget one particular night as I was hearing these thoughts coming to me, I just said, I am who I am. I know who I am. And all of a sudden, it, I felt this light like rain clouds parting to let the sun shine through. And so that was the end of that experience. So what I began doing after that, I said to myself, I just want to be a good person. I just want to be a good person. I don't feel like the person that I've become in the earth and narrative is really who I am because love is our original state. Love is zero. Even when you play a game of tennis, when they say zero, they say love because it's not a, mat a matter of doing acts of love. It is a matter of returning to our original state so that everything we do is from love. And so knowing that love is my uninfluenced state of being, I just knew that. I said to myself, I don't care what happens to me, I have to be loved. And so around that time, it was so much stuff happening to me because I was just in an environment with a lot of stuff going on. And so I said to myself, I don't care what happens, no matter what a person does to me. And I'll never forget, I was in a physical altercation and um, I remember telling God, all right, I want to be loved, but this particular altercation, I'm going to have to put love to the side to protect myself. And I remember feeling so bad because I just know, even though I could have possibly been physically hurt, if I reacted, it wouldn't have been of love. And so I just said to myself, I said, okay, I'm willing to die for love. And I'll never forget the person that I was in a physical altercation with. They raised a weapon um, in a sense that they were going to kill me. And I had surrendered everything. I know it sounds like a simple thing, but when you're facing death, you surrender everything up until that point. And so I surrendered and I felt this little shift in my spirit. And I said to myself, okay, this worked. So from then on, um, I began to have these other experiences to where I would enter into these states of sleep paralysis and I kept alchemizing. I didn't know it was alchemizing the mind at the time, but every time somebody would do something to me, like say if someone called me ugly, 
I would just say something like words are only tools that we use to express the resonance that we feel inside. And a person can only give what they have to give. So if he's calling me ugly and words are only tools that we use to express how we feel, then he must feel that way. And he's using this word to, as a conduit to pass this feeling along to me. So instead of taking offense, I will be of a higher consciousness and understand that this person is simply telling me that he feels this way. So at that time, people would say, you're ugly. And I would just be like, let me help you. And they didn't understand it because I was, I had shifted consciousness. And I did this for three or four months. And to the point where one particular time I was asleep and I was woken up out of my sleep. And when I was woken up, I felt these eyelids underneath my physical eyelids open up. So it was like, for example, the word ugly applies to the physical consciousness. Now that I was alchemizing or dissolving the physical consciousness, I was putting the physicality of the body to sleep, which was awakening the spirit, which is why it's called spiritual awakening. And so as I put the body to sleep by alchemizing the keys of consciousness that the human state of being reciprocate, I felt these spiritual eyes open up underneath my body. And I was, once I woke up, I was taken to this palace or this kingdom. And the best way I could describe it, it was purple, like a royal purple. And um, I stood beside Jesus. Now, I could not physically see Jesus, but just as your kid or your uncle would stand beside you and you could smell the scent of their cologne and feel their ambiance or presence is the same way I just knew this was Jesus. Was this palace the third level of heaven? Yeah, I found out later that this was the third heaven. And so as I was alchemizing, which I didn't know at the time, as I was alchemizing, what I was doing, see, what people don't understand is human is not necessarily physical. If you look at the word human being, human is a state of being, just like divinity is a state of being. So you have human being and divine being. So it's not the fact that the humans have forgotten that they are gods. The human consciousness is the forgetfulness of being a god, if that makes sense. It's like a lamp with a dimmer switch. If you turn the light all the way up, that equals divine consciousness. If you turn the light all the way down, that equals the human consciousness or the human state of being. So as I was alchemizing, it's, it's like meditating. All, all a person is doing when they meditate, they're sitting away from the reciprocation of earth. And when you put that to sleep, the spirit awakens. When you go back into the reciprocation of earth and consciousness, the spirit lies dormant. And then the spirit is just used to power the body in a sense. And so I was taken to this palace and I was standing beside Jesus. I won't say um, what was said is kind of sacred to me. And um, when this happens, I, this just light like an atom bomb just explodes and I'm back in my body. And it's, it feels like light is coming out of my eyes, out of my ears, like I'm transfigured. And so when I immediately got up out of the bed, when I was back to my body, the lady that was laying beside me, and I just have to tell it like it is, I was like, she's evil, she's evil. And I just started running, Jeff. I would look at the lamp and the lamp would look evil because the lamp was a mimicry of the light that we already are. And so I started realizing that this realm is just a mimicry or a simulated state of being in contrast to who we are in essence. So everything that I seen from vehicles, um, I, I would know that we are vehicles and our thoughts are keys of consciousness. So if we drive our vehicle in accordance to the earth and consciousness, that means that we are not sober. We are drunk in accordance to the lower earthen realm in contrast to being a divine being. So I started seeing that everything here was a mimicry of something real 
and it looked like a betrayal of our essence. And so I just started running outside. I didn't know this at the time, by the way. I didn't, I just started running outside. I would look at the cars. I was like, betrayal, it's evil. And I just didn't know what to do. And this is gonna sound odd. So I ran back in the house and I had to close my eyes. I couldn't look at anything because that light that people say, I wish we could get feel that here we can, it's who we are in essence. That was just flowing out of me. And it was like, um, I couldn't look at anything. So finally, it, I, would, I would try to wean myself back into the environment. So I would turn on the news and it would say 10 people died today. And it, people would be like, well, what's for dinner? And I would just go to crying like a little baby. Like, how have we been desensitized to see that and just say, what's for dinner? Or I would see people saying, I'm trying to be successful. And I would say, how can you be successful in the same realm that a person can get murdered in? I would see little kids playing cops and robbers with guns and they would be smiling. And I would say to myself, how can they be smiling and, and have made a loving game out of something of a lower vibration as shooting someone because they robbed you? And this realm just looked distorted. Like I, I would see kids push a little girl out of the swing to show the little girl that he likes her. And I was like, this is distortion. And all the parent would say, boys will be boys. And I was like, he did the very opposite of what he was trying to show. So everything looked like distortion to the point for like a week, I could not look. I could not go outside. So I had to turn off the lights. I could not look at the simplest thing. And so I turned off the lights. And um, to give you the to, long story short, to keep it moving, because so much happened, um, I began to keep alchemizing. And I would, I would just say things like, well, after I came back from the third heaven, I would keep alchemizing. And I remember looking in the mirror and my iris were glowing. And this is going to sound odd. Jesus was inside of my body. And um, he was, Jesus was telling me these revelations. Like, say, for example, if the kid would do what they were doing, um, I would just automatically know things like, well, we are energy. And so whatever you spend your energy on, when you energy is money or currency. So whatever you spend your energy or currency on, you receive a product back. So what we spent our energy on has made us a product of our environment. And so as a product of their environment, that's all they have to give. So don't see it as a bad thing, have compassion for it. So once Jesus began to tell me this, it was like Jesus would tell me these things and then he would leave. He would tell me these things and then he would leave. And I didn't know what was happening at the time. And um, I was like, where are you? I need you. And come to find out, it's like an open book test. The teacher will read the notes to you and then they'll leave out the room and pop a test. And so what Jesus was telling me at the time that we're not really here to worship him, we are just as he is. So as he was telling me these things, he would leave so I can stand, I could stand on the very principles within my own spirit. And then when I would master whatever he told me, he would return, give me something higher. And then he kept doing that till it became me. And it was like I transformed. And around this time, my brain started lighting up is the best way I could describe it. Um, people say, why don't we use most of our brain? It's because, as I said earlier, everything that we tend to is in this earth and narrative is premeditated. So as you go about this earth and narrative, the, the same neural routines are going to light up in your brain because you're doing the same thing over and over. So I began to shift my consciousness and I began to understand that everything in this consciousness of the human state of being, it could be the most foulest thing. It was happening for me because you don't know who you truly are until you've experienced who you are not. So everything that was happening for me, 
I had to shift the consciousness past it. And that was me growing up. What the human cause grows up, growing up is high C turns to coffee, cartoons turn to soap operas, power wheel turns to cars. That's the same thing on a, in the same level of consciousness. Growing up is actually shifting past the human state of being back into the divine being. So I began to understand that they were products of their environment until I could see no evil, hear no evil, or fear no evil. It was just like I was this pure reciprocation of love. And all of a sudden, Jesus was gone, and I was in my the living room or the living area of the box, and my ceiling opened up. I was not asleep. I was not dreaming just as weird. I'm talking to you. This is the same way this happened. My ceiling opened up and I seen these fireworks. Do you know how you pull down the projector in a classroom and then they project the images and it kind of looks like they're in midair? If you pulled up the projector, just that's how these fireworks look. And I didn't know what was happening. I'm sitting on the couch and they said, doom, 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 doom. And I was like, what's happening? And I'm looking out the corner of my eye, and this is just half of the story, Jeff. I'm looking out the corner of my eye, like, what in the world is this? And I see an opening. I know it's God. Just as a battery, a remote control comes to life when the battery or source of power is put into it to handle its proper functions, is the same way I came to life when the source of power was in my midst. I knew it was God. And, um, I just begin to say, you got the wrong person. I'm from Mississippi. They People don't like me. I'm not a famous preacher. People outcasted me because I feel like true wealth is the luxury of spirit and integrity. People outcasted me because I was saying to myself, wealth will never equal a man, a piece of paper with a man's face on it. I was like, you got the wrong person. I'm not a prestigious person. I just want love. Everybody walks over me and I'm going to allow it because this is how I feel. And I said, I just kept saying, you got the wrong person. And I said, who am I to you? And these, the fireworks said, doom, 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 doom. And it said, R E G A L. And I'm just sitting there like not knowing. And um, I said, I didn't know you could talk to me, talk to us like this. The preacher said we had to go through you. Like, who, who, how do you talk to this? And that same voice that was, um, that told me to open my eyes, I said, why didn't you talk to me? And it said, the voice said, your vibration is too low. And then what I did, Jeff, I jumped off the cloud, out of the, um, just off the couch, just, not knowing what to do. And I just started like, okay, we got to help everybody else. We got to help everybody else. They think you have to physically die to go to heaven. We got to help everybody else. And when I said that the ceiling closed. And so I'll, I was explained why the ceiling closed after that, but I'll leave it at there because like I said, I had seven videos worth of stuff, but for the most part, um, that's my testimony. Well, just to let you guys know, Tone's channel is called Life is But a Dream. Now, Tone, you were in the third level of heaven. While you were right. over there, did you happen to visit the other levels? And if not, how do you understand that that is the third one? The reason I understood it, um, like I said, it was a whole lot to my testimony. After I visited that place, I was walking outside and I remember asking God, where was I? And I seen this lady um, by the pool with a book and the book said third heaven. And so I said to myself, there's no such thing as a third heaven. At that point, I was running everything through the Bible because I didn't know any better. So I looked in the Bible and I seen that a guy named Paul had the same experience that I had. And he went to the third heaven. And another part of my testimony, which that's why I said I left out a lot, 
Um, during this time, it was this orb that came out of me is the best way I could describe it. And the orb was sitting in midair, like the projector screen. And I was running from it at first. And I was like, who are you? And it, it drew the symbol of a tree and the tree had a circle around it. And so when I looked up the circle, it was a form called the tree of life. And so I looked it up and it was like the tree of life is in the midst of the paradise of God. And I realized that all it is, Jeff, is the brain is a garden. And we know this because when you plant seeds of thought into your brain, it produces fruit, just like a garden does. So whatever thoughts you plant in there, it brings a character into fruition. So you are the result of the seeds of thought that were planted into your garden. And so as I was saying earlier, man took the elements from the ground. They learned to make cement. They poured the cement over the ground. They took the elements from the ground. They learned to make metal. With the metal, they made cars. With the metal, they made poles, traffic lights, stuck signs in the ground. But if you take all of that out of the ground, it's just earth. There's no such thing as Miami. There's no such thing as California. If you take all of those signs out of the ground, it's just a big garden. And so man poured concrete over the earth, made cars, made buildings. There wasn't an IRS. There's not an IRS in the ethereal. All of these things that we're going by is a man-made narrative. And so we begin as neutral energy. And once that neutral energy conforms to those things, it brings the character that you are now into fruition. And that's why I tell people in order to escape to exit the simulation, you must understand that the very character that you're trying to escape from is a production of the simulation. Because the divine being doesn't have taxes, the divine being doesn't pay bills. So as long as this is the consciousness that is reciprocating within your physical body, this is the consciousness that will anchor your he you here. Are you saying that being human Right. Is being in the simulation. And so if you want to exit, you just, you have to become divine. The, the one that's trying to exit, well, let me say it like this. The one that leaves will not be the one trying to leave. Look at a caterpillar, for example. Everybody likes to talk about the glorious transformation of the caterpillar, but they neglect the fact that the caterpillar even though the caterpillar's purpose is to find a high place, hang from a tree to become a whole different creation, there are some dead caterpillars. There are some caterpillars that reciprocated the consciousness of that ground level and got into it with other insects. They never found, found that tree or shifted that consciousness to a higher place, and they died as a caterpillar. And so that's what we are. We are cocoons because we are not the shell. And so our whole purpose is to shift past the human consciousness that we are grounded in, find a higher consciousness to release us from the shell so that we will ascend as the divinity that we are. That, this, this is why we suffer. We have descended into a consciousness and taken on things that have no association with who we are in divine essence. And so once we did that, our mind set up mental appointments and expectations of what we want to happen in this earthen narrative. And once those expectations or appointments are missed, it causes disappointment. And so what ends up happening, we go through what we call life with disappointments and wonder why God is suffering but, and we say things like, you know what? God is on my side. I'm not easily broken because we don't understand that the very character that we're saying is not easily broken has to be broken and surrendered. So it's not something happening to you. Your suffering is something happening for you. It is telling you to release the attachments of the lower consciousness to fly away in divinity. 
in this cocoon, the brain is reciprocating the consciousness of the caterpillar in which we are grounded in. So we are not shifting into higher states of consciousness. We are worried about the appointments and disappointments of this lower consciousness, but the goal is to ascend to a higher frequency. So everything that we're calling pain is actually for us. The body is a lie detector test. When you look at a lie detector test in the police department, they don't go by what you say with your mouth. They hook the wires up to your body. And so they ask you a question. And even though you can say something with your mouth, they don't go by that. They go by your heart rate. Did it speed up? Did your heart, is your heart pounding? Are you sweating? They go by the indications of the body. So in that same way, we have been giving a body in this simulation so that we can ascend. So when what we call things are happening to us, even though with our mouth we say earth is not our home, the fact that we are feeling pain from the things that are happening in this lower realm, the lie detector test determines that that is a lie. If earth is not your home and you're saying that with your mouth, your body must come into agreement with what is being said. So the body is actually a helpful tool to bring into agree what the spirit is wanting to tell you. So just as a welder, when a welder gets ready to reshape an item, it has to apply heat. Wherever the heat is applied, that's where it rebends the item. So since we have been descended, we have descended into a human state of being, Pain is that heat. It is an indication that it's time to renew the mind, reshape the mind into a higher state of consciousness. And so we're calling it pain because we have forgotten that this is not who we are in essence. We are not humans. We are gods. We are gods. We are not coupon clipping, pine saw buying, mopping the floor humans. We are gods. And the body is the lie detector test that tells whether you believe that or not. So what you are called suffering is actually you resisting who you truly are in essence. And you're holding on to this, the things happening in this little narrative as a human being, if that makes sense. Why do we choose to descend and come here? All right. This is how I like to tell this story. All right. Everything starts from neutral energy, right? And so let's say I wanted to create some beings. Once those beings emerge, they are automatically of me just because they emerged of me. We are automatically of God. We're all children of God. We're all equal of God because we came from the same energy. But until you have experienced, we'll just call coming from that energy 100%. But until you have experienced, zero through 99 percent you can't fully say that i am yet you can't fully say that you are until you have experienced what you are not so the minute you think even though you emerged in equality the minute you begin to think as a brand new being you begin to either stay in that level of equilibrium or you begin to descend because we have free will. So we thought and we descended into physicality. And so what we are looking at in a sense is still the beginning of creation. And so what the consciousness that we have descended into, we're calling it life. You will hear a person say, my job, my car, the kids are, my life is going pretty good. We're going to soccer practice. The kids, that's not life. External things and situations are not life. Those are just external things that have captivated you as neutral energy. Life is actually the force that animates you. So this is why when you meditate away from soccer practice, away from the job, away from those things, the body is put to sleep and the spirit awakens. But as long as you're reciprocating the consciousness of these things, the life force that you are lies dormant. It just is being used as a battery to power you because you think you are a physical body. There's a lot of things that the spiritual community say with their mouth, but they don't embody. So this is a good place that we're in because everything that causes you hurt, everything that causes you pain is something that you have to transcend. 
It's only called pain and suffering because you took taken on an identity in which you are not. And you had to experience that because you can't fully say I am until you've rejected or denied or ascended past what you are not. So it's just the open experience. Um, like I like I always say, earth is just the big theme park. If you take away the streets, the um, the signs, the cars, the houses, it's just a big garden. And if you look up garden in the dictionary, it means park. So it's just the theme park. And so you may have Atlantis, all of these different things. And so this is why you detach. Because as long as you are reciprocating the consciousness of these things, you are driving your vehicle with those keys of consciousness, which anchor you there. The humans think grounding is when they take off their shoes to ground they, their feet on the earth because they don't understand that grounding is the fact that you are a spiritual being that has descended into a physical consciousness in which your feet don't touch the ground. You have already been grounded. In the ethereal state, everything happens immediately. Everything happens immediately. In this state, there is a lag. Even this chair I'm sitting in, it was something I had to manifest. It's a, it's a form of thought. I had to think about it, but somebody had to go chop down the tree. Then they had to chisel it to make it. That's still a form of manifestation, but it's a lag. So that's why there's even a scripture that says, seek the kingdom and then things will be added to you. All that is saying is, the lag that you are experiencing, why things don't happen immediate, like, immediately like it does in the ethereal realm, because you have taken on an identity of IRS, you have taken on an identity of lower vibrational activities that is not who you are in essence. When you return to who you are in essence, which is the equilibrium of God, you will be in this realm and things will happen immediately because the human consciousness is that lag. It is that veil separating you from who you truly are in essence versus who you are in society. So when you alchemize this consciousness to become one with God, it's like a wedding when the bridegroom, the groom lifts the veil and then they become one. That's the same way it is with us. When we dissolve the consciousness of this narrative, we then return to the oneness, the veil is lifted, and we become one again with God. Can you give us a practical way to dissolve this consciousness as you just spoke of? I want to say this. I'm glad you asked that. I want to say this. Um, I can. I was just doing an equation for time travel. Um, and, and please remember your question because sometimes I veer off. I have so much to say. So I want to make sure I answer it. I was just reviewing an equation for time travel because there is no time. If you think about the sun, the sun goes up, the sun goes down. And when the sun goes up, the sun gives the earth light. So the earth does not have its own light. It is this external ball providing the light. So when it goes up and provides light, we call that day. When it goes down, we call that night. But if you took away the external ball of light, you will see that the earth is suspended in darkness, in the same state of darkness. It's like Groundhog Day. Nothing is really happening. So what we've made up, when the sun goes up, it gives the earth light. We call that Monday. The sun goes down, and then it comes back up. We call that Tuesday. But if you took away that external source of light, you will still see that the earth is suspended in that same day. There is no day nor night. It is just an external ball of light moving closer and away from the sun. There is no Monday. There is no time. Even in that sense, all time is we've made up numbers to say one, two, three, four. And then we said hours days, weeks, we made that up to measure the sun moving closer and providing light. And then when it gets about right there, we say that's six. But if you took away that external source of light, you will see that the earth is suspended in that same place of darkness. And so with that being said, 
how would you know the difference between Monday and Tuesday if we wouldn't have took the elements from the ground, learned to make buildings? They made a church which you go into on Sunday. They made a church that you go, I mean, a building or a school that you go into on Monday. Sun goes up, you say, I'm going to go to that building. Sun goes down and up, you say, I'm going to go to that building. If you erased all of the buildings and took away the external light, you will see that we're living the same Groundhog Day, reciprocating the same consciousness. How is today Wednesday? Wasn't it a Wednesday last week? We're living the same thing over and over and over. And when you realize that, that alone, that realization alone is love because love is your uninfluenced state. As long as you are reacting to the ups and the downs of this setup, as long as this setup can upset you, it is showing that your brain has took on the anchors of this setup, which will not release you out of the narrative. So even Jesus, when he was slapped, he said, give the man the other cheek. Because if you react, if you react, you become a reactor and a reactor, a reactor powers a generator. And this is why humans have generations of family members, generations, mom gets together, creates child, child grows up, becomes old, they get together, create child. It's generating beings that create the same consciousness, which is in a sense, a recycling bin. And they reciprocate the same consciousness over and over. They get upset by the same things. So what love does, unconditional love does, if you notice, it says unconditional. Every contract has terms and conditions. So if you notice, I no longer went by the terms and conditions. If someone called me ugly, I no longer go by that term. So now that I no longer go by that term, I'm no longer under that condition and my body is no longer contracted or is a product of the simulation. And so unconditional love actually breaks you out of the simulation. I would also like to say what people don't understand, they have humans do things like stare at the sun and say, you'll open your pineal if you do this, you'll open your pineal if you do that, listen to this music. That's okay because we're free, but understand this, your mind is an intangible thing, but your mind is a belief system that powers your physical operating system. So just like your belief system or your mind can control your physical brain and operate your tear gland, it's the same way your way of thinking can operate your pineal gland. So all this is, is you are awakened through realization. And people always say, but it hurts so much. But that's because what you truly are is so much. You are a God and you have to realistically experience everything that you are not. So you can truly say that you are, because if you haven't experienced everything you are not, a person will be able to say something to you and there'll be doubt, there'll be wavering. But if you've gained who you are, by understanding and experience is who you are. It cannot be taken. You just said something, and I want to kind of clarify that, that you were talking about staring at the sun, but I mean, right. people can't do that because they'll burn their eyes. Oh, it's just something I've heard. Like oh. they say, they'll say things like, um, stare at the sun and you open your pineal. It's just my way of saying the same way your mind can make a physical tear come out of your tear gland, it's the same way your belief system can make, um, can open your pineal gland. You don't really have to do these external things. Oh, so that's, so you're just saying that was a figure of speech. You right. have to do that literally. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't stand at the sun. I've actually clicked on a video before and I've seen someone say, these are three ways to open your pineal. And a lot of people say things like, you can say we're protons, we're neutrons, and all of this is a simulation, but you have to understand that you were put in the simulation for a reason. If you are still getting upset at a traffic light, do you understand what that would be in the ethereal realm? 
And so we are here to learn patience. We are here to learn kindness. We are here to learn unconditional love to return as the creators we are. And then, like I said, we have subject ourselves and became residents in creation when we're the creators of it. So what we've done, we've left actuality and we went into a spinoff of an alternate reality. And when you leave actuality and go into reality, you go into duality and you dearly depart. Think about the words I am. All it means is me. All I am means is you. How are you trying to reach who you are if it's just you? You have dearly departed and you live in an underworld underneath who you are. That is the state of death. After watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you open to that? And if so, how do they contact you? Um, my Facebook page is Heavenly Vibes. I will leave it in the um, the um, comment section. And like I said, um, I don't really, I'm not really here for attention. I'm really just here for people that are, that is looking to ascend this realm. I'm not trying to be popular. To be popular in the very frequency that you have to transcend would be to have futilities in the utilities of the body, which will anchor you in a consciousness that is futile. So you you can reach out to me on Facebook if you are seriously, seriously exiting the simulation. All right. So it's Heavenly Vibes, and I'll put a link to that in the description okay. below. Yeah, you're welcome to. All right. Well, do you have anything else that you're working on that you want us to know about? Um. I'm not really working on anything. A lot of people write books, but um, I just want to say this real quick, if I can. Um, sure. When I came back, I didn't know who my parents was. And a lot of people didn't understand that. We are a neutral energy. And as I said, Atlantis, Earth, they're just themes. And so the theme of Earth is a biologic. So the logic of Earth is biology. So things grow here. Um, you have biological parents and your biological parents teach you how to tie your shoe. I teach how to ascend the consciousness that would have a need for a shoe. So I'm not of the biologic. So with that being said, every time you talk, you're writing on your brain. Every time you think and accept the thought you write, you're writing on your brain. The character that you written right now has either put you under the subjection of what pains you or over it. So I don't have a book. All, all of us are writing books according to this biological realm. This is your biography. So what I'm working on is helping people to exit this simulation. Freely I receive, freely I give. Well, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Love. Love. Love is the answer. And what we call love is not love. Love is not going into a courthouse and signing a piece of paper and then loving someone in that household or structure. That is an indication that is not harmonious with everybody. So once we ascend the biologic, you will understand that it's really no such thing as uncle, nephew. I love this person and not that person. We are all love pretending to fall in love with each other. We're going to places pretending to be friends, but if you take away the consciousness that's in the brain that's pretending to these premeditated things, you will see that we're already connected. The biologic is um, the thing of lower vibration. So love is the answer, but love has to be true. It has to be so true that it will dissolve everything in this lower realm. Tone, thank you for your message and thank you for being my guest. Thank you for having me, Jeff. Love. Thank you. Love you too. All right. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.